my pleasure to introduce Ashley Hutchison, who is the speaker today. Uh, Ashley is um, a graduate of Bits University, BSc Honours in Applied Mathematics and a PhD uh, in uh, Turbulence Theory here at the Turbulent Week. Um, now, Ashley is currently the, uh, a Newton International Fellow of the Royal Society of London. This is a very prestigious appointment. Um, the International Fellows um, conduct research for two years at a, a university in the UK of their choice. And Ashley is um, working at doing research at Cambridge University in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. This is a, a very uh, one of the leading departments in the world uh, on uh, fluid mechanics. Um, now, Ashley's current research includes experimental and theoretical studies of confined viscous gravity um, currents and the fracturing of non newtonian fluids. Um, Ashley enjoys research that is interdisciplinary and also challenging. And the title of Ashley's talk today is confined viscous gravity currents. Good morning, everyone. It is really nice to see some of you in person and <clears throat> hi to everyone online. Thank you for tuning in. Um, it's really nice to be back at this. So thank you to the center for allowing me to give a talk today. All right, um, I'll introduce the title of my talk is Confined Viscous Gravity Currents. Sorry, this is very sensitive. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out or just explain who my collaborators are. Rory Gasno was a student at Bits University. He's now also moved overseas. Um, he's doing a PhD overseas. And Professor Gray Borster is who I'm working with at Cambridge University. So this was work that was actually started when I was still at Bits, but I've only had the opportunity now to try complete it and hopefully bring it to a close in the next few months. Okay, so just an outline of my talk, I'll give a brief problem description. We're going to be focusing mainly on the experimental side of the work that I've been doing. So if you are feeling a bit tired this morning, uh, don't worry, there's not too much maths that you need to follow. Uh, more pretty pictures, hopefully. Then I'll just look at some mathematical models, just simple models that we are trying to use to explain our experimental results. And we'll see how that actually works uh, in the comparison section. We'll note that the mismatch is actually quite severe. So this will lead on to further work and some conclusions. All right, so this is what I've been working on for the last few months. Um, the setup is rather straightforward. So we've got two parallel plates. These are solid, so fluid cannot escape from these. On the bottom plate, there's a hole where fluid is pumped out into the space between these two plates. So we can set the spacing between the two plates, which are called capital H, and we can also set the flux. We'll see later that even setting the flux experimentally is actually rather difficult. So what happens is, is that as this fluid is pumped out, we get two regions of flow that develop. We've got an inner contact region where the fluid is in contact with both the bottom and the top plates. And I denote the edge of that by RG. That's going to be a function of time. So we want to find the evolution equation for that, both experimentally and using mathematical models. Then we've got the second region here where the height of the free surface has not quite reached the top plates. And we just have the most of condition on the bottom plates and zero shear on this free surface. So the goal really will be to also determine the profile of that free surface. And unfortunately, we will be unable to compare that to experiments results. You'll see from the images, it's quite hard to determine, but at least we'll give some indication of what we can expect. Okay, so that's the setup. So I'll just go straight to the experiments. Unfortunately, I was unable to take a few more photos because eventually I was hit with COVID, um, no longer contagious, and you can edit that out of the video. 
but um, <laughs> uh, I was unable to to go do some recordings and I wanted to you know do like a mini tour of lab but this is the best that I have I have a nice corner in the lab that's pretty much all mine um, where I work there a lot during the day so here is basically my setup I'll just explain a little bit so here you can see that we've got our two parallel plates they have made out of uh, perspex and they are placed on an elevated stand, which is given here. The reason why the stand is elevated higher than where um, the pump is is because we want to not have the addition of uh, gravitational effects. So it's important that this is actually elevated. This ladder is used because I actually need to climb this to operate the camera. So it looks nicely down, um, you know, onto, onto the, the experiment. Um, so this in the background here, that's a piston, and that's part of the, the pumping system that we use to actually pump out our fluid. So it's connected, you know, to uh, a motor, and it's all run by setting the speed at which the piston travels and the distance. So it was quite interesting getting that ready because that was actually specifically and specially designed for this purpose. All right, so I'll, I want to just explain some of my experiments, the first experiments that I, I did. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, the diameter is of, of the source is three centimeters. It couldn't be any smaller because syrup is extremely hard to pump out. So it needed to be something actually sizable, which is not great because we would like to have as close to a source term approximation as possible. That's a point source, but in this case, we have to settle with that. The, each of the square plates is 20 centimeters, so just to give you an idea of how you know, large these things are. Um, plate spacings of one centimeter were used for these first set of experiments. However, we will see later that the plate spacing is one of the main errors that actually comes up into the experiment. So we use Bernier calipers uh, to try to provide a more accurate measurement of the plate spacing, because you'll see that there's small variations in the plates could be like you know a fifth of a millimeter but it actually is important to account for that so luckily the lab is pretty much at a constant temperature of 19 degrees uh because syrup which is what we're using for these experiments has a viscosity that's highly dependent on temperature so if we have to run experiments with a different temperature every day that would be a huge issue because we would be varying a parameter that we actually want to keep constant we use what's called Lyle's Gold Syrup, which is apparently the good stuff in England. But after using it so much, I definitely wouldn't put it on my mother's got used to make crunchies. She insisted on Lyle's Gold Syrup, the one of the lion of the <laughs> Yeah, so, so this is this is the nice one. Um, but it's the one that we can also get in bulk. So, and a lot of syrup coming through that lab. So here's just an image of one of my experiments. So here are just the parameter values. These are just approximations at the moment. I'm still, you know, updating things as we go along. Just to point out the plate spacing, I have been set at one centimeter, but due to the slight variations, it's actually slightly different. And even this correction here is really important. We'll see that all the parameter values depend on uh, the spacing to the power of four. So any error in the spacing is going to be much more magnified because the space to the power of four. So what we basically want to do is we want to study these experiments and we want to vary the flux to see what actually happens. So how do these two regions grow? So you can see in this picture, we've got this inner contact region. You can see it's darker, it fills the entire gap between the two plates. And then this outer region here, which is just light in color, where basically the height of the free surface has not yet reached the, the top plate. So you might guess, might, that for higher fluxes, this outer region would be smaller. That could be just, you know, a guess that you might make. Um, call this, uh, you know, just an hypothesis. And I guess that's what we're going to test. But we want to find the relationship between how these regions actually evolve and the flux. So what we'll do is we'll keep every other parameter constant, and we're just going to vary the flux. Okay, so the flux. This was the source of a lot of my stress um, in the lab. Calibrating this pump. So, like I said, the pump is a piston, 
And it's got like a screw type motion where you basically set the seat the speed and it will do steps according to that speed. However, if there's any resistance that the pump cannot handle, it will just skip a step, but it won't retry to do that step. So what's happening is, is that we can't get a constant flux because we're getting these skip steps. And also sometimes the flux is greatly underestimated. So this was actually a huge problem for quite a few weeks. Um, and it led to looking at the, the pump again and stacking the current so we could try get a greater range of fluxes that actually work. But even once we have the pump working, we don't know yet what the relationship is between the speed at which we're setting and the output flux. So one of the technicians at Cambridge, Mark, he suggested something very clever. And this was basically using an experiment to get a relationship between the speed of the piston and the flux. Now, you might ask, why can't I just use the experiments of the confined versus gravity current? Because surely I can approximate the volume of the fluid looking at this image. So just to give an idea, this inner region, I know what the space is, and I know I can calculate um, the area of this just using image processing. I'll explain how you do that. But that's not too bad. I can definitely get the volume of this region quite accurately. The problem is the volume of this outer region. I don't actually know what that high profile is. So by not knowing it, I would have to guess some kind of high profile. And by guessing, I've already introduced further errors into it. So instead of looking at this setup, the idea was to decrease the plate spacing and to get what we call ED short load. So basically, instead of having an inner and an outer region, we just have one inner region. So the fluid fills the entire gap between the two plates. So from this image, I can calculate the volume much easier because I just need to worry about the area of the circle, and then I know what my plate space is. So what we do is we run a series of experiments. So this is just one of the experiments that I'm showing here. So this is just at three different times I took more measurements than this. But basically, I know the time at which each of these have been taken, and I've got some reference time, so I know how much time has elapsed. And what I do is basic image processing. I know that this outer circle has um, a radius of uh, 20 centimeters. So what I do is I draw a line from that to the center. It's not drawn very well here. That's from then I can set the scale. So I know that for 20 centimeters, there is X number of pixels. That's basically how it works. So once I've got the scale, then I can fit an approximate circle to this and find the area. So once I've got the area, I just multiply by the height and that will tell me the volume at that time. So what I do is I plot volume against time and the gradients of that must be the flux. So I do a whole lot of experiments using that. And from then, I can find the relationship between the flux and the speed. The first indication that our pump was not working well was when our relationship between the flux and the speed did not pass through the origin. So that wouldn't make sense because we would assume that the speed of zero should definitely be the flux of zero. You know, that would make sense. So we got results that were not passing through the origin. And that's when we realized when we looked closely at the pump that it actually wasn't performing um, as well as what it was meant to be. All right, so when did these issues actually come up? Well, the syrup is extremely viscous. It is just a nightmare to work with. So what happens is it provides a lot of resistance. It's very hard to pump it out. Now, it becomes even harder when you're pumping it out into really small gaps. So this is why there's so much resistance and why it's not easy just to connect some kind of a pump and you know, get the syrup going. Um, so there were some modifications made to increase the range of fluxes in which it can operate, but only from our experiments results will we be able to see if this range of fluxes actually covers what we would like to study. So far, we are a little bit away from the end. Okay, so we are restricted by considering fluxes that are not too large and our gaps can't be too Okay, so for the actual experiments, which were run I, so many times, um, the setup takes a while, the cleanup is even longer. 
The worst is when experiment does, you know, it doesn't perform well and you sat there cleaning up the syrup for an hour. So <clears throat> that can be a bit soul story. But anyway, when the experiment goes well, it's great. So this was one experiment where it actually did go well. Um, I could have made these images look a little bit nicer, but I decided to leave them completely undocumented. I don't know, just so you can see that things are not always like pretty and you know clean and the lab and come out beautiful, beautifully. All right, so this is just one of the experiments, and I've taken some images at different times. So you can basically just see the evolution uh, you know, of this. And what we want to do for these experiments is to basically determine the radius uh, of each of those two regions. So I want to know how does this evolve with time and that outer region. And then I'm going to look at some simple mathematical models to see if I can actually get some agreement. So I use the same procedure that I did with the short flow in that I calculate the area of this and I know the relationship that the area is pi r squared so I can calculate the radius from that. So I get the radius at different times and here's just an example of one of these experiments. So here I've got the outer radius and this is the inner one. These dots are my data points and this bit here is, I'll explain that just now. Um, but basically, you just want to get all of these data points to see how these two interfaces are actually evolving. Now, what's really interesting is that we found that the square root t is a really good fit. So we didn't assume this initially. What we did is we looked at best fits of the form alpha t to the n, and then we looked at just simple basic curve fitting to find out what n was. Now, the fact that n came out pretty close to a half was actually extremely interesting and revealing because for unconfined viscous gravity currents, that's when the top plate um, is, is not there, that edge actually behaves like t to the half. So that was a rather encouraging result that from just our data, we got something that does match with unconfined viscous gravity currents. So we were quite happy with the t to the half relationship. And you can also see from you know the fits, there's no error bars here. But I mean, I don't think anyone would be terribly disappointed if their data points and you know they curve look like that. So actually, yes, the, the flow is axisymmetric. Yes, it is. Oh, approximately. Sometimes it's you know it was a bit oh yeah, but for the most part, it did remain axisymmetric. Sometimes early on in the experiments, it took the inner region a bit of time to kind of even out. So you might be pumping at a certain... Constant flux. Well, yeah. Okay, so what we now want to do is we want to find out how these constants alpha g and alpha n, this is assuming this root dependence, actually change as we vary the flux. But instead of varying, comparing it to the flux, it's, it's actually nicer to use a dimensionless parameter. And this one is actually very interesting because if you rearrange this, this is actually the height scale of an unconfined viscous gravity current to the gap width of the cell, which is capital H. So we were quite happy to see the links between unconfined viscous gravity currents and confined viscous gravity currents, and how everything at just an experimental stage of this case seems to be consistent at least in you know suggesting the forms of the evolution of the interface. Okay, so lots of experiments were done. Here I've actually showed the ones that did work. I'll show you the ones that didn't, and I'll explain why they didn't. But you can see that I've repeated a couple of them. And that was basically for my own sanity, because, you know, what if I, I did these experiments and I just got a completely random looking data set, which I mean could happen. Maybe there's so much um, you know, uncertainty in this that it just looks random. But luckily, from the results that we do have, which is not as extensive as what I like, I'm still developing them, but they do actually seem to follow a trend, which is good. So they're not like all over the place, you know, these data points. But here what I've done is I've plotted alpha, so uh, this is alpha n that corresponds to the leading, the outer leading edge, and this is the inner leading edge. This is just base fit curves based on just curve fitting. There's no model associated with this just yet. But this was just to see if there is some kind of a pattern. So looking at this, you know, just looking just with, you know, visually, doesn't actually look too bad. 
by, by that I mean with experiments, you can't actually just expect these data points to lie perfectly on these you know, curves. There's a lot of error and a lot of things out of our control. But what I wanted to also check by fitting these is if I increase my Q and I make it great enough, if I increase my J, make it very large, what I would expect is that that inner region is going to basically dominate and then outer region is going to be very small. So I should be close to the usual flow. So what I expect is for high values of J, I would expect these to intersect. And just to check, <clears throat> all right. So just plotting these two graphs, it doesn't change again. Um, notice that there is an intersection point at J is equal to three, but also notice that I can't with certainty say anything about that experimentally because all my experiments have been conducted in this region here. So I need to get closer to values here to see if, um, if what I think should happen actually does happen. So that's what we're working on at the moment. All right, so just to briefly look at some of the mathematical models, um, just for those that are not familiar with fluid mechanics, just very basically the equations of fluid mechanics are all derived from conservation principles. So here we've got conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. We just consider control volume, so something that's fixed in the fluid, and we look at what is entering and exiting that volume. So we start with the Navier-Stokes equation, and what we're going to be doing for this case is consider really long thin flows. So what that means is I can actually get rid of most of those terms, and I get equations that actually look quite nice. But that's exactly what I want. So I don't want to go too complicated. I want to keep it really basic. So the more simple, the better, and then we can only hope that we get good agreement with the experiment. We also need some appropriate boundary conditions. Note that with this problem, I've got moving boundaries. So that's something I'll need to look at. Okay, so for the mathematical model, um, I'll just explain the different regions. I'm going to be looking at three different models, just in case detail in each one, but the first one will be in a bit more detail. <clears throat> so here are my Gravity equations. You can see that those are a lot simpler than the Navier-Stokes that I showed. This is all due to the long, thin, very viscous approximation that I'm using. And what it means is I can actually solve these quite easily. So just taking this one here, I can integrate the fluid pressure. So U here is the velocity in the R direction. Uh, v is the velocity in the Z direction, and P is the fluid pressure. So I can integrate these two equations, and basically I get an unknown pH coming out, which I need to determine. So I apply the no slip at the top and bottom plates because we are in this first region. The fluid is in contact with both plates. All right, so I'm not just done just yet. Uh, conservation is a very central theme in this problem. So what I do is I calculate the line flux. Basically, the line flux is just when I multiply this by 2 pi r, that will give me the flux that's been supplied, which is step by the pump. <clears throat> so I use that with mass conservation, 2 pi r, q1 is equal to q0. So this is what the pump is supplying. And then I can use this and uh, mass conservation to solve for pH. Notice I still get an arbitrary constant of integration. So at the moment, all I can say is I can get the general expression for P1 and U1. Well, U1 is solved fully, but I still have a C of T that's unspecified as for now in P1. So in region two, the situation is slightly different. We have the flow variables now I'm going to denote them by a two. And instead of no slip at the top and the bottom, we just have no slip at the bottom and we've got zero shear at the free surface. So there's nothing special about the outer annular region. It's just in contact with A, which we would assume exerts most shear stress um, on the free surface. So I can solve, um, again, those equations get P2 and U2. What I don't know is this height profile H. And again, keeping with the theme, I'm going to use mass conservation to determine that. Okay, so same idea, we calculate the line flux again, use conservation of mass, and this should give, well, to some people this might be quite well known. That's the same as an unconfined viscous gravity current. This is an expression for an unconfined viscous gravity current. So essentially what we've got is a heady shore region and then a viscous gravity current region. And we kind of want to append them together. 
So to do that, we're going to look at a couple of different models, but let's start really simple. The first thing we're going to do is to ignore surface tension. Now, that could actually be quite a worrying assumption. Why? Because, well, surface is very viscous, and also we're looking at extremely small gaps. So if you're looking at some, if you have like a measuring cylinder and you pour some syrup in it, you notice that there's quite a strong meniscus. That's due to surface tension. So ignoring surface tension might actually, you know, not be the best, but let's just see how it goes and see if surface tension being neglected is actually the problem. All right, so when we ignore surface tension on the inner boundary, we have intersection with the free surface. So we assume that the height of the free surface is equal to the spacing, H. We also have con a continuity of flux, which gives me an expression for the gradients of H. And I also assume that the force is continuous, so that equates to the depth integrated pressure matching across that interface. So what that means is we can solve fully for the pressure in region 1. On the other end now, because I'm still ignoring surface tension, I just assume that the height of the free surface goes to zero. Right, so this is what I'm going to be using. And then the last condition that I use is global conservation of mass, which is given here. So you can see that this pi rg squared h, that's just the, the volume of fluid in the inner region. And then this integral times two pi could be the volume of fluid in the outer region. So we can differentiate this and we get an um, equation for rn dash. So just to summarize, because I don't expect you to remember all of that, we have, what basically looks like an unconfined viscosity current, the high profile. And I've got these conditions here. Notice that this is a second order equation, and I've got four boundary conditions, but that is, of course, because I don't know what Rg and Rn are. So I don't know what my moving boundaries are, which is why I need those additional conditions. Okay, so let's see how well this model actually performs. And sadly, so before we get on to the actual patching to the experiments, um, we look for some similarity solutions. There are many more people in the audience that know far more about some um, similarity solutions and symmetry than what I do, but I just cheated and I use physics. So I know that a really good characteristic height would be the gap between the, you know, the spacing between the face. So I take that. And then I just use the equation for H to get this variable here, theta. Um, so when I impose that similarity solution, I get my expressions for Rg and Rn coming out. I don't know what eta G and eta N are. Those are going to be determined numerically. But basically what I get is this ODE coming out and these boundary conditions here. So one thing that I do want to point out at this stage is that looking at the system of equations, this equation with the boundary conditions, there is actually only one grouping of parameter values here. So there is, this is dimensionless. So there's actually only one dimensionless parameter coming out. So what this means is, is that we've only really got one parameter that we can play around with, which we'll see if that actually works, but I mean, it doesn't. Uh, but you know, it's, it's interesting to see that, just to keep that in mind uh, when looking at these models. So. With no creativity at all, I'm going to call this J, and I'm going to be varying J to find out how these results change. By the way, this is the same J that was defined previously for the experimental results. So you can do this both from you know, physical arguments and actually just from scaling analysis. Okay, so um, the results were not pleasing. <laughs> uh, they were not great. So here's just what I plotted. So these are my data points, and these two curves are the model bits. So I plotted this against J. Um, you can see quite clearly that both alpha G and alpha N are greatly underestimated. I mean, uh, yeah, they're underestimated by the other curves. So they're much higher, you know. Look, this alpha N is not too bad. I think we can agree that, you know, maybe there's some hope over here. These values, I put them there, but we actually found out using a whole lot of different calculations that the pump wasn't working properly. So unfortunately, I cannot say anything conclusive about this region. And for now, I will have to just focus on this region here. So I guess at this stage, what was concerning is the mismatch between 
the alpha G and you know the data points. This, I mean, gives some indication with some error bars that maybe it does lie within the area estimate. But we are definitely not happy with this. This is you know not good enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to investigate the effect of surface tension to see if perhaps that is you know the problem. Now there are two things that we're going to do. We're going to include surface tension first at the outer region and not include it at the inner region, and then we're going to include it at both. And I'll you know give the motivation as to why we do that. Okay, so when including surface tension on um, the, the outer edge R N of T. What we do is we use we approximate the meniscus near to R in a T by a semicircle of diameter H of N. So this is this is a model, this is an approximation. So we look at this outer region, and basically, because of surface tension, this will basically roll inwards instead of just going to zero, as happened when we didn't have surface tension. So we denote the, the leading edge where it would roll and intersect with the lower plates by R N. And I assume that this happens at some H capital N. So H capital N is this length over here. I don't know what H of it is. So what I do is I find it by balancing the depth integrated pressure. So that's just a balance of forces. And then I can find H N here. Um, gamma here is the surface tension and well, gross density G gravitational constant. So basically what's happening now is I've actually introduced another dimensionless parameter into my problem. Instead of just having J, I've now got this additional parameter as well. <clears throat> okay, so just to summarize for this model, I use the, the same technique that I was using to find the similarity solutions. The only thing that differs is the boundary conditions. So um, basically this one over here, you can see that at the outer edge, instead of going to zero, this was previously zero in this condition, it goes to H capital N. But I need to ensure that H capital N, which is um, scale, it mustn't exceed one because that would mean it, it's greater than the plate spacing, which doesn't physically make sense. So there's actually a bound on this parameter and I have to look at values within that bound. So this is the system <clears throat> that I have to solve and you can't solve this analytically, unfortunately. Um, always a like analytic solutions. But uh, we have to go to numerical, numerical results. Okay, so we still got our J parameter that we had from earlier, which is still the ratio of the high scale to the gap width of the cell. But I've also got the surface tension parameter. This is new, so this is coming in as well. So the question is, so will my model actually fit the data better? That's the question. Does anyone want to guess the answer? So basically, um, just to for anyone interested in numerics, we can define a function G here, reduce this to a system of two first order equations. You can write my boundary conditions really nicely. Uh, best ways to integrate backwards and then to minimize the residues. So that's the numerics is quite neat. So I must be honest, it was, it was actually quite fun better than that. <clears throat> so it was it was fairly simple, but you have to think about it quite carefully. This is different to what we would use if we were solving with no surface tension. Um, what we would do is to find the asymptotic solution near the leading edge, and then to use that to integrate backwards. Okay, so the results were even more disappointing because now we've actually added in something to our model, and we're still getting basically a terrible fit. Now, I guess thinking about it now, that's not completely unexpected because we have added surface tension in the outer region, and that's actually where the fit wasn't the worst. It was really that inner region that we were more concerned about, in essence. So perhaps including surface tension on the outer rim was not actually the best way to go. Looking at surface tension between the two regions might be more important. So we can motivate that. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so we, I'm actually going to show you some images just now and we're going to motivate as why we include surface tension there. But just for anyone that's interested, we can actually plot the high profiles. Now, unfortunately, I can't actually compare these two experiments and results. You can see from the images that there's a lot of light reflection and all of that. That's actually something that's needed though, because without the flash of the camera, you can't see those two regions. 
So there were a couple of experiments where I did an alpha flash and nothing showed up on the camera. So there's lots of things to think about when it comes to this. <clears throat> but basically, you can see that the surface tension parameter, what it does is it actually does alter the, um, the high profiles quite significantly, and it will change the position of that lineage. Okay, so also what was, I think what was maybe slightly encouraging about this model is when you plot the ratio, um, you did actually get a case that the large J values would tend to one. So at least that seems to be there, the fact that we would expect TD short flow for very large values of J. So, I mean, it's not all terrible. I think it shows that we're on the right track, but not quite understanding the full story. Okay, so this was <clears throat> the most recent modification that we've done. And it's actually quite simple to motivate it from the experimental images. Basically, what I've done is I've zoomed in on the part here, which is shown here. Apologies about the resolution. But basically, what I wanted to show is this region, it's not a sharp defined line. You can see here that there's actually really two lines that you can see in the image. So we've almost got, <clears throat> we don't have a sharply defined region. And that was the motivation for now introducing surface tension. At this point as well. And this would hopefully also improve the results because we're now looking at where surface tension is probably the most important. Okay, so I won't go into the details of this too much because it follows very similarly from the previous models, but there are some changes. All right, so with this model, all we <clears throat> end up doing is replacing these boundary conditions here. Uh, well, with these two over here, because we've added to extension at this point. <coughs> so instead of the height profile being continuous, we assume that it doesn't intersect uh, the top plate. It actually, it, it's actually at a lower value. So, which actually makes sense from the images. It's not a well-defined, you know, line. So you wouldn't actually expect the height profile to be continuous. So this discontinuity introduces a little bit more complexity when balancing the fluxes, because you have to take that into account. So we get this condition over here, which replaces the simpler looking one. But numerically, this wasn't very difficult to implement at all. Okay, so here, I guess, you know, where things are, this is when maybe it's time to go to the pub and have a glass of wine, because here are things are actually looking a lot better. So you can see now that these data points are actually quite nicely almost aligned with what the theory is predicting. The points over here, notice that those haven't changed terribly much, which makes sense because I've now only added surface tension to that inner region. I don't expect that to drastically change what's happening on the outer region. I mean, there will be, a feed, there will be feedback, but um, I would expect most of the changes to be here. So this is looking quite promising, but what we really need is you know, more data points. Um, Plan was to do all of this before I came to this, but you know, then COVID struck, unfortunately. Okay, so what about other S values? So, so far, I've only considered um, a single S value, uh, which was basically just set by the, um, you know, the spacing between the plates. I've just looked at one centimeter. So, what I did is for some other experiments, I looked at different plate spaces. Um, we still have question marks next to some of these data points because they were conducted before the pump had been modified. Uh, but basically, this is for a greater gap. Uh, this was 1.5 centimeters. And here are the data points. This is the model without surface tension, shown on the left hand side. And this is the model with surface tension. Now, again, I am a little bit cautious of these two points, even though I would love to believe that one. So nice, you have to let go. But you know, that's how it goes. Just because it follows the trend doesn't mean that you've actually done everything correctly. So, you know, I guess honesty in science is very important. Um, so I'd love to leave that one, but looking at the actual experiment, experimental images, we're not quite sure that the flux was constant when we looked at, you know, estimating the volume. Okay, so this is for a smaller gap. Um, so this is for no surface tension. You can see that there isn't one with surface tension because um, for some reason there are major numerical errors for that. I have to try and figure out why. 
Um, but basically, you can see that this one is quite interesting. Again, perhaps the outer one is actually not looking too bad, but the inner one, you know, that's quite a problem. But again, these results need to be checked as well. Um, I think there are only about two of these points that I would actually trust at this stage. Okay, so yeah, so this is what we are basically looking at. Um, just to summarize and conclude, did a whole lot of confined physics gravity experiments, um, some of which worked, many of which didn't. So that is just the nature of experimental work. Hi. Um, and then we looked at various mathematical models. We are not terribly happy with the at the moment. Also, there is a lot of approximating and all of that, so the shape of the meniscus. We've said it to be a constant you know, shape for each experiment, but really it could actually depend on the flux as well. So we'll need to look at something like that. Um, so the fit is definitely poor when surface tension is completely neglected and probably best when it's included at both of the leading edges. But a lot more work is required both on the experimental side and on the mathematical model side. But it is quite, it's rather exciting when, you know, you have this perception that things will just work out, you've got this model, the experiments look easy, and then they don't. And where people lead to, you know, new fluid phenomena and a greater understanding of these types of problems. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Any questions from the floor? Yeah, or from um, If the pump was struggling to pump the syrup, um, which obviously led to the flux not being constant. It is not possible to use a less viscous fluid to ease up some of the pressure on the pump so that the pump can go at a constant flux. So have you tried something that's slightly less viscous? So that is definitely a consideration, but the reason why we're not considering that is because we're making use of the lubrication approximation. We want to use as high a flux as possible. That's almost the non-negotiable side of it. But I mean, technically, in you know, in a laboratory, it, it should be possible to implement you know stuff like that. That is quite high safe. And for the most part, it, it is actually quite impressive how well it does work. But understanding its limitations is sometimes a bit difficult. Um, but it it's it's interesting how we understand that by looking at the data and trying to get estimates of the volume from each experiment and compare it to what we think it should be with flux times time. And we notice that there definitely are variations. That's, yeah. The next step is to actually put a camera on the piston with the ruler on it, so I can film it while it's actually going, so I can see when it misses steps or anything like that. Actually, that was my next question. My next question was, if you can see inside the piston, then as it's pushing the fluid out, you could at the same time measure the change in volume. Would it not be easier so the thing is that the syrup's actually in a bag. Um, so because you can't have it just loose in the piston, it will just flow, you know, be squeezed through the sides. So it's in a bag. So the volume is not exactly the, the same volume as the, the tube. But that's not really an issue. I mean, it's fairly close. But you can, what I have done with the experiments is mark off where the level of the piston starts and where it ends. If it does end at where I specified it to end, like after five centimeters, then I know it couldn't have missed any steps possible because it doesn't repeat steps, it doesn't try again. So if it reached that distance, then I'm happy. But for some of the experiments, the steps are so small that it's actually difficult to see the list. Just from the floor, um, I saw a log R in your equation that I Singular at, at source r equals zero. Yes. Um, what happens with that? Yeah. So that's just um, so the log r singularity. Uh, we was was that in the that was in the pressure. So oh, yeah, the pressure, yeah, yeah. So that wasn't an issue. It's just in the pressure. So it's that's when the derivative. Yeah. Pressure, yeah. Yeah. So that would yeah. So with. With the question of the, the singularity with an unconfined viscous gravity current, you've got the log of R singularity at R is equal to zero. So technically, I mean, another thing that we would like to look at at some stage is surface tension, you know, would be responsible for leveling off that log R you know, singularity as well, which a model that looks at that would also be quite useful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
the um, online question uh, would, would the definition like be post the question yes um, um dr Perio has his hand raised up again <laughs> so it's about the chest stress at the upper surface in both regions uh so there is a region where the fluid is in contact uh with the upper lid and there is a region of, of free surface and okay. that then means that there is a kind of uh a jump from a region where there is a non-zero shear to a region of zero shear yes correct does that not have implication about the uh the lack of continuity of the of of the uh uh of the, the, the derivative of, of the velocity. I'm just thinking, I mean, does that pose any issue or it doesn't? The fact that we go from a region of, of non-zero shear and then a sharp uh, jump to a region of zero shear. You're 100% right, um, Gideon. So because we invoke the lubrication approximation, we can't actually match the velocities directly. We have to, um, we have to match integrated quantities. So that's one of the things that have to do when we invoke the lubrication approximation. So that's why we consider the depth integrates pressure when um, you know the fluxes don't actually match the velocity itself. Oh I see. I see. So but of course so the fluxes match and the interface of the two region. All right, can you please repeat that? The fluxes are, yes. are, are matching at the interface of the two regions. Yes, yes, the, the fluxes match um, because those are the depth integrated quantities. Oh, yeah. okay. well, that's, that's a very interesting talk. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Gideon. Ashley, uh, it, it seems to me that you're going to have to change the fluid, uh, the, replace the fluid. Because it, you're always going to have this problem with the very thick fluid and the action of the, the system. So we have. So really, modifications have been made that have allowed us to look at greater fluxes. However, there's another thing that you can do is you can also consider slightly um, greater gap spaces. Because it's really, the it's not just, yes, the fluid being very viscous plays a role in the pump striving to pump it up, but it's also because it's into a very small gap. That's greater resistance. The smaller the gap, the greater the resistance. So that's why we actually looked at some experiments with the larger gap where the flux is actually not so restricted. So wouldn't you consider a thick oil, for example? Um, just, as, just to build it up towards the, the spectacle situation. You know, I think... Um, well, it's oil too expensive at the moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the worry is, is that it would be viscous enough. We need something incredibly viscous. That's what we want to do. So we've decided on what we need and we're going to work around that. I was just thinking with the whole Ukraine crisis, the, oil, the, the Indian aunties are all scared about the oil prices because they can't cook anymore. But the syrup prices are still good. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. We are actually overcoming this issue though slowly with the pump. But in any experiments, there are going to be restrictions that we have to look at. You know, I think that's quite normal. We don't want to compromise on the fluid though. Thank you very much, Ashley. It's a very interesting talk. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you.